Hello, my name is Julian Richter, and this is my presentation on polycrystalline materials and grain boundaries. So what is a polycrystalline material? A polycrystalline material is formed by many small crystals growing simultaneously, which you can see in figure A here. This is a image from our textbook. Um, so the grains are formed at varying directions, as you can see here in these nuclei that are in the same area, keep growing and growing until they impinge on each other. And once they impinge on each other, they form these boundaries and where the grains touch, and these are called grain boundaries. So what's the difference between a polycrystalline material versus a single crystal material or a monocrystalline material? Um, so a monocrystalline material is anisotropic, which means that the properties vary depending on the direction that you measure them at, so the, depending on the Miller indices of measurement. Um, they have a consistent lattice structure. Uh, they are difficult to synthesize because it requires the crystal growth of a single nuclei, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and a couple applications of them are semiconductors and silicon wafers. So we did talk about silicon wafers in class. Um, so they are silicon wafers are a material used for producing semiconductors. So those go hand in hand. Uh, moving into polycrystalline materials, they are commonly isotropic um, if grains are randomly oriented, which majority of the time they are. They're anisotropic if the grains are textured, which we will get into this um, later on in this presentation. And polycrystalline materials are stronger due to those grain boundaries, so because of the inconsistent lattice structure that makes for a stronger material. So going into anisotropic versus isotropic examples, um, an example of how this can be observed is with an elastic modulus. So this, we're measuring the elastic modulus. So this is again from our textbook. Um, as you can see, you have four metals here and the crystallographic orientation at which the modulus of elasticity was measured in gigapascals. Um, so as you can see for aluminum, copper, and iron, they are all anisotropic because their properties, their modulus of elasticity, varies based on the direction of measurement. Tungsten, however, has the exact same modulus of elasticity regardless of the crystallographic orientation of measurement, which shows that tungsten is isotropic. So here is a 3D depiction of a polycrystalline structure um, that I made in Tinkercad. So as you can see, we have grain boundaries here, grain boundary here, across all the colors. So each color represents a different grain. So these all grow from single nuclei until they impinged on each other and created this polycrystalline material. So applications of polycrystalline materials. Majority of engineering materials are polycrystals, obviously not semiconductors as discussed earlier. Um, those silicon wafers are monocrystalline, but polycrystalline materials are everywhere in the engineering world. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a recent developing technology, which I thought was pretty exciting to learn about. Um, and they're trying to use polycrystals instead of monocrystals in solar panels. So some of the benefits include affordability and higher efficiency for high sunlight areas. So the monocrystalline solar panels are made of silicon and silicon is very useful as a monocrystalline material as a semiconductor. Panels made of these silicon wafers, as discussed in class, are very expensive, but they're very efficient, and they're, they have better heat tolerance than their polycrystalline counterparts. However, the polycrystalline materials are less expensive, and they also have the same lifespan as the monocrystalline materials. Um, so these monocrystalline materials, they can cover a smaller area of land. You can't necessarily have a full field full of solar panels made of monocrystalline because it's very expensive. Um, they don't need as much sunlight though, so they're better for areas that are prone to overcast and a lot of clouds and a lot of rain because they are more efficient. Um, and they do have a more sleek look, so if you're putting them somewhere like on top of a house where you care about the appearance of your solar panels, then monocrystalline would be a better option. However, polycrystalline materials are up and coming because they can cover a larger area. You can have them in huge fields because they're less expensive to produce. Um, however, they do require more sunlight. They're not as efficient as storing energy of um, 
where less light is being provided, so lower sunlight areas. And they have a less sleek look. They have more of a blue tinge instead of being a sleek black look like the monocrystalline uh, solar panels. So in a place where appearance matters, then they aren't the best option. But a lot of research is still being done on this, but I thought this was an interesting uh, contrast between monocrystalline and polycrystalline materials. So grain boundaries. Grain boundaries are very important in polycrystalline materials because they have a big um, role in the properties. So as discussed prior, boundaries are formed when the single crystals grow until they meet. Um, grain boundaries are actually classified as an interfacial or area defect um, in a material. So some properties of grain boundaries are low density, high mobility, high diffusivity, and high reactivity. Um, part of high mobility includes slip systems. Grain boundaries are, plain, are prone to um, slippage, which is caused by tensile elongation. Um, so next, deformations of polycrystals. So deformations of polycrystals can actually change a polycrystal from being isotropic to anisotropic, which goes into earlier when we said how polycrystals are anisotropic if, they are text if the grains are textured. So an example of deformation of a polycrystalline material is rolling the material. So in this image, we have an example. This is before the material was rolled. You can see a more regular, um, rounder look to the grains. And this is after rolling, so this causes the grains to be elongated, which also introduces texture. So the rolling impacts the orientation and the shape of the grain, which changes it from being isotropic to anisotropic, which makes sense if you think about it, that the properties would vary based on the direction you measure them in this image versus in this image. These are my references, and thank you for listening.